Now let's worship the Lord and listen to his word and hear what he has to say to the church, which is what the last book of the Bible says. Let the Spirit speak and let the church hear what the Lord has to say to the church. If you have a Bible in the pew rack and you didn't bring one this morning, the page is 1557. And if you carry your Bible, which is the tradition of this congregation, our gospel comes from John chapter 6. The gospel of John chapter 6. While societies shift in their perception of Father, I would like to speak this morning on the title announced in the bulletin, Fathers Should Know Best, and if not, He Does, or A Father in His Relationship to the Father. Over the years, now 19 on Father's Day, I have spoken about being a father, what a biblical insight into fatherhood is, how can we be better fathers, What does God expect of us as fathers? But this year, for the first year, I would like to look at God as a father and fathers as they relate to God as a father and preach and teach and study together with you as students of the word what he is, this father of ours. And then, as it applies on this very special day of dedication of fathers, how it applies to each of us who may be fathers or to some of us who may become fathers. It was interesting to me that our Lord Jesus Christ never spoke about him being a carpenter. He was a carpenter's son. He never refers to his life in Nazareth or to his earthly family, as we would call it. He never speaks of Joseph. He speaks to his mother once and says to her, as he does at the cross, words of pronouncement as it relates to her life after he is gone. He does speak to his mother and to the disciples on one occasion when they are whining and complaining about the fact that he should spend more time with them. It came in the peephole at the beginning at the age of 12 when he says to his mother and to his father, primarily to his mother, who says, Why have you done this? Why are you not more considerate of us? He says, Don't you know that I must be about my father's business? At that point, he separated his earthly responsibility to his parents to the primary responsibility that he had to his father. Our Lord's entire conversation about his relationship as a man was to God the Father. He teaches us to pray that way. He says, I do all things that please the Father. I speak not of myself, but I speak of the Father. The works that I do, I do from the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. His entire relationship as a man is as it relates to the Father, to the Heavenly Father. And that is a primary insight into each of us today as fathers. It's an interesting thing that self-worth or personal value is determined many times by not what we determine in our hearts primarily, but by what we understand or relate outside. I would call it other directed. Now this, you'll have to think for a couple of minutes with me, and you're thinking of course all the time, it's a very bright and intelligent and alert congregation, but you'll really have to tune out on everything just for a minute or two. The person that you admire the most Usually, you determine your worth by what you think that person thinks of you. The person that you evaluate as the most important or most admired to you is the way you think about yourself as you think about what that person thinks of you. The first impression that a child has is looking up. All children look up. 
All babies look up in nursing, in feeding, in the changing of a diaper. The child is very vulnerable and basically embarrassed when the diaper is removed. And the child just lies there totally helpless looking up. And when the child is able to look up, he sees frown or anger. He sees resentment. He sees impatience. He sees uh, criticism or scolding, or he sees a smile. He sees happiness. He sees the joy of the parent as the parent looks at the child. And the first prominent impressions that rivet a personality in a child's life come by the reaction of the person they look up to or their parent. And so very early, a child begins to evaluate their importance or their identity as they relate to what they think the person they look up to thinks of them. And this is where negative personality patterns begin to develop. I'll say it again. The person that you admire the most, you are basically interpreting your self-worth based on what you think that person that you admire thinks of you. And you can take that even on a higher level. Now stay thinking with me. Men particularly interpret their self-worth based on what they think the group or the person they admire most thinks of them. And that's why you couldn't be on the in circle if you don't know the latest sports figures. You couldn't possibly identify your worth unless you see the people or the group that you admire the most as accepting you. And teenagers particularly face this. They have a group at school that they admire or wish they were part of, and so they adjust their personality and even their values based upon what they think the group thinks of them. And it is even farther than that because our values of ourselves are interpreted by what we think other people that we admire think of us and the values are manufactured by television and by radio and by the print media. Uh, you couldn't possibly think that anybody was smart or up or in if they didn't go to the latest movie, Jurassic Park. And when that first was blasted uh, upon our culture, it was primarily, of course, to be a money maker. Batman, a billion dollars in income with all of the artifacts and the products. A thousand different items or products to buy came from Batman. A billion dollars. And they now are saying this Jurassic Park will be about 500 million, maybe even more than that. And when it first was told what this film was about, it was to be almost panic. People wanted to see it, the dinosaur and so on. And now, even the media, even the world that doesn't have the value system that we have is beginning to say, now this is what you need to do with your child as you, as you experience it. That was yesterday's Observer. Last week I read about it, that a man is gobbled by a dinosaur. A severed human arm is shown. Dinosaurs chase, chase youngsters. It's very violent. A man's mauled arm is glimpsed. A steer is devoured by the dino. You can hear it munch. A goat is eaten by a dino. Severed portions are shown. Kids are nearly crushed in a vehicle during a dino attack. They emerge cut, battered, and shocked. Kids are stalked by two evil dinos. I say it's just a film. It doesn't make any difference. Well, does it make a difference? Is it true that people take things in from their eye? Jesus said, the eye is the window of the soul. Now, why am I telling you that? Because I'm against movies? No, not, not really at this point. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about impressions. I'm talking about things that people feel and sense. The way people are molded and shaped. So the in thing is to be part of this, the in thing, because that's where everybody is and where everybody is you want to be, of course. This is the standard and our worth, here's where I'm going, our worth is determined by how we think we are accepted 
by the things that seem valuable to others and by the people we would like to be like. And that's why it's so important for a father to be so strong and virtuous and bold and tender and loving and nurturing. Because the idea of father comes to us from God. The most important impression that a man has is determined by his interpretation of his father. Fathers need again to be the head of their homes. They need to be the models for other men. God made male and female, male first, not that woman was an afterthought but that because in the order of creation, God is father and he creates man and man then becomes a father and only a father can understand what he's to be like as he has relationship to the heavenly father. And that's identified by our Lord Jesus who does everything as a replication of and a reflection of the Father. All that we know about God comes to us through Jesus Christ as he interprets what God has done, what God is doing, and what God has culminated in the person of himself. Now let's look at the text, shall we, in John chapter 6. The Father. God is the Father. Will you notice, please, in John 6, verse 27... Labor not for the food that perishes, but for that food which endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man, see how he relates to himself, shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Look down to verse 39. And this is the will of the Father who sends me, that of all that he has given me, I should lose nothing but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of the Father that sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. He uses the word Father in verse 32. He uses it again in verse 37. Again, would you notice in verse 39, the will of him in verse 40 is, of course, the Father. Again, we see it in verse 44. No man comes to me except the Father. We see it in 45. And hath learned of the Father, he comes to me. No man, verse 46, hath seen the Father except he who is of God. He hath seen the Father. And so on throughout the text. Our Lord is talking to his disciples about their fathers. And here he uses a metaphor. Metaphors must be very carefully thought through unless we make them to be more than they are or we interpret them less than they are in their intrinsic basic meaning. You know your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as he relates the people who are listening to him to Israel. They are Jews. They are part of the Israeli tradition. You know your earthly fathers. And do you know what happened to your nation, to your earthly fathers, to those who are part of the family tree? You remember what happened to them? Well, they were in the wilderness, in the desert, and they didn't have any provision. And the Father sent them bread. This is also the teaching early after the time when our Lord feeds the disciples and the people with the five loaves and two fishes, which is the context. Uh, You have seen me provide bread for you to eat. Baskets gathered, some left over. Now I want to take what you've just experienced. Our Lord in teaching always took a human experience and made a principle. Most preachers find a principle and try to find an illustration. Our Lord did it just the opposite in his teaching method. He took what was going on then and then took it to a higher level. And that's what I'm trying to do this morning as it relates to a father as he understands the father. You remember the bread that came to you just on the hillside recently? I want to take you back further. Do you remember your fathers? They also had bread that came without their labor. It came down from heaven. It was bread that came down from heaven in the morning like dew on the grass, six days a week, and double on the six days so that they wouldn't even have to gather on the Sabbath, which is the Lord's. Well, that was bread that came down to your fathers on the earth. I am the bread that comes from the Father in heaven. 
I am the bread. As they ate that bread, you should, and here's the metaphor, don't flip out because of it. As they ate that bread and were made hungry, you must eat and partake and share and receive me as a gift from the Father, because I am the bread of life. If you drink and eat of me, you shall never hunger and thirst again. He's speaking, of course, about life-giving substance to earthly people gathered in the desert and spiritual life-giving sustenance in the person of Jesus Christ as we believe in him. Would you notice that? Verse 33, For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life unto the world. So first of all, we see God as a life giver, as a nourisher. Here is a magnificent illustration. And I'm in danger this morning of taking the understanding of God as Father and relating to us as fathers as we relate to God and also applying that as we become earthly fathers. That's another sermon in and of itself. And for me, in my preparation, this is where I became confused. Because I wanted to talk about fathers as they relate to the Father, and yet I saw the importance of saying, now, what kind of fathers does that cause us to be? We'll make a little comment here and there about that, but that's another subject. But if God, the Father, is a giver of life, and this life is of primary importance because only as God gives life to man and gives life to his son in the incarnation can we understand, here it is, it's heavy, what it means for us to be fathers. We are not just having sex. We are not just engaged in romance. We are not just experiencing copulation. We are not just planting some sperm and seed. We are giving life and the responsibility of the father in procreating is the continuation, the perpetuity of life, and this life comes from God. This, why, this is why it makes it so sacred and so important for us to understand the high sanctity of procreation. It is not just an emotional encounter. It is not just a passionate intimate experience which is so wonderful in the will of God. It is the giving of life. It is procreation. Be fruitful and multiply. As I have breathed into you, you two now become one. And you become the procreators. You continue creation by the giving of life in the intimacy of personal wedlock. So God is a life giver. Now that's the application. Let's go back to the primary point. If God is the life giver, and if he gives his son, then it is primary, it is, it is ultimate, that each man in this church this morning understands that as the father gave his son, he gave his son for you, and that you must be related to the father through Jesus Christ. What am I saying? I'm saying you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Eternal life comes to you through God the Father and through His Son. And God gives life to you, eternal life. This is soul talk. This is existential talk. This is eternal talk. This is ultimate destiny talk. That as you believe in the Son of the Father, God gives you life. And this life is perpetual. It is permanent. It can never be lost. Look at verse 39. Here's where all Baptists should shout. Boy, I miss E.B. Hill's congregation. I couldn't keep my mind on what I was saying. And the offering was taken by six very large women. And they come forward. They were all in pink. And they stand down here and they have white gloves on. And they go like this. I feel like they're at a funeral. And pastor says, now we'll have the offering. Real loud, so loud. And they sit there. They sat there. He said it again. Now we'll have the offering. And a couple of people said, Amen, Amen. And he said, And I said, the pastor said, Now we will have the offering. And everybody said, Yeah, Amen. Say it. So he doesn't say it again. It's amazing, these churches. They just respond. We sit in silence and suffer. They at least get some relief from the pain. They say something. All Baptists right now, just because you're a Baptist, 
First, maybe before you're a Christian, give me an amen. Are there any Baptists in this church? Right. Here's where you guys ought to shout and bang the tambourine. Oh, our church is getting too charismatic. Well, if you think it is, you don't know what charismatic is, I want to tell you. Look at the text, will you, Baptists, and say an amen when we come to it. This is the Father's will who sent me, that of all, that he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but shall raise it up again the last day. One, two, three. Amen. Amen. All that the Father gives me, the original Greek says, who cares about that because it's more precise, I lose not one, even one. And that's why in 1611, the English translators over in England said, no thing. When we think of things, we don't think of people. The Greek is, of all that the Father gives me, I shall lose not one, and then the emphasis is not even a single one. Point of action. That's wonderful. Salvation is forever. It's a gift. It comes from the Father. And if you're a father today and you don't know eternal life and you've never been saved and born again and come to the saving truth of God's love, do it this minute. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. He's a life giver and that means eternity, permanence, once saved, always saved. Hallelujah. I will lose not one. One of the thought. Let's look at it. Verse 47. The will of God is that we would have everlasting life. And this everlasting life begins when you believe. And it is the ultimate fulfillment. Look at verse 47. Truly, truly, I say to you. He that believes on me has everlasting life. Now, what does that mean? Look up from your Bible. It's just a minute. That means that when you die, you live forever. Everlasting. That's true. But that's only part of it. When does a person receive everlasting life? Answer, the moment he believes. You begin to live forever, not when you die, but when you believe. Eternal life begins at the point of faith, not at the termination of physical life. It is a gift from God, and this is called the new birth. You are born again when you believe, when you live, not born again after you die and then receive something that you were promised. So you don't anticipate living forever. The moment you believe, you begin to live forever. I give unto them eternal life. And they will never perish. Now think with me for a couple of minutes. Go back to the metaphor of eating and drinking. He says, if you eat of me, you will never hunger. Now one thing about hunger is, it's continuous. You eat, and then maybe 30 minutes later you think, oh, we need a little dessert. How many times have you gone to a restaurant and you abstained, abstemious, you did without, you're a martyr, you weren't going to eat because you have to watch your weight, and then on the way home you hit McDonald's for 69 cents, or you get back to the house and you have some leftover sherbet which doesn't have any calories, and you take a dip of it and it's so nasty with all that ice on top of it and you throw it away, and you say, listen, why don't we go out and get some real ice cream? Is there anything else in the freezer? You know, you, you just need a little zip, you know, in whatever you're doing. And every five or six hours, they say you should eat six times a day instead of three big meals. I'd move it to nine. I mean, I'd take it right up there. You can wake me up in the middle of the night and give me bread. I'm a great bread eater. I love bread. Well, whatever. What's that got to do with this? Because I'm hungry and I didn't have much breakfast this morning. I had two pieces of toast and I'm anxious to get to my birthday lunch. So you know what I'm thinking about. It's in the back of the mind. It just comes out, okay? 
There's a woman in our church. She sits on that side, and she counts every time I mention food in the sermon. She'll give me the total this morning. So I'm probably up to three already. Back to the subject. You will eat and be hungry again, but if you eat of me, you shall never hunger or thirst. Get the metaphor? He's talking about something at the higher level. He's talking about the thirst for the soul. Now watch it. If you don't have your soul satisfied with God, if you don't begin to live forever by believing, you go through life trying to fill that insatiable desire with things that only satisfy the physical desire. The most spiritually, listen to this, hungry people in the world are the people who appear to have everything. Now you think about that. The primary stars of Hollywood, the important people of the world, the people who have it all are saying they don't have it because they have this insatiable desire to be filled. And our Lord God said in the person of Jesus, you should hunger and thirst after righteousness. And then you would be what? Fulfilled. One, two, three. Fulfilled. One, two, three. Fulfilled. If you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you will be filled. Opposite, if you don't hunger and thirst after righteousness, you will not be filled. St. Paul says the kingdom of God is not in food and in drink, but in righteousness and in joy of the Holy Spirit. One of our experiences the last week after we finished preaching in Los Angeles was to go north in a car. We hadn't done it for... Well, since the years we were in seminary out there, in graduate school, and we had heard about Hearst Castle. William Randolph Hearst was the son of George Hearst. George Hearst acquired uh, 265,000 acres from the Spanish way, way back. Had this huge piece of land, magnificent, magnificent ranch. Well, he died, as all men do. And his son, William Randolph Hearst, who was the grandfather of Patty Hearst. For William Randolph Hearst had a son by the name of William Randolph Hearst, and his daughter was Patty Hearst. You know a little bit about that story. He had this property, and he had unbelievable money, the growth of gold and, and mining and everything in California. And in San Simeon, which is a place that's nowhere other than this barren, beautiful, brown desert, particularly in the summertime, in the wintertime, it's green, this magnificent ranch overlooking the Pacific with these gorgeous blue waves coming in and beautiful blue sky. He built this, this castle. It is the finest piece of real estate anywhere on this continent. And for $16, with a $2 discount if you have a coupon, you can see this. And Carol and I decided we would, uh, we would see it, and so we did. Many of you have seen it. Several of you since I got back told me, did I see the Hearst Castle? The answer is yes. Well, what did I learn? I learned a lot, and you don't want to hear a lot about what I learned, and you certainly don't want to see my pictures. But nevertheless, I learned that here was a man who was probably one of the most foremost, I use the word twice, uh, powerful figures in the United States politically and uh, a great art collection. He was dominant in, in, in California and in Hollywood. It is alleged that, uh, uh, that he put the angst on, uh, well, who cares about that? But uh, this magnificent wealth is in this castle. It's way high on the hill. You've never seen anything like it. Ceilings that he brought from Spain, the finest of marble. I mean, it's just unspeakable. The largest silver collection uh, other than uh, in, uh, in London, 275 tapestries that are just invaluable. And, and to this place, he brings by special charter seaplane, by a yacht that comes from San Francisco. I mean, it's a, it's a real bump to get up there from L.A. In chauffeur-driven limousines and by train, he brings the finest of Hollywood. 
Charlie Chapman. Name anybody. They were there. Winston Churchill. And the guide will tell you of all the wonderful people that were there. He leaves his wife and links with a prominent actress. And she stays for a while and the wife comes for a couple of days. I mean, you can imagine the story. But so what? So what? The more he had. Finally, the state was given to the state of California because it's incomparable to think that it could ever even be developed. He had the largest zoo in the United States. Animals from all over the world in a thousand acres just for these animals. You can't imagine the wealth. And you just absorb it and you think about it. And you say, well, this is his place. But where is he? He's gone. And what is, I, what is it I'm trying to say? It, it is that this man... Basically, I believe from what even the guide said, he was longing and hungering and wanting something. He would come down to this special dining room and make his entrance through a little door that looked like a bookshelf. And all these famous people would be there. It could only entertain 20 or 30 people at a time in, in outhouses or, or, or mansions next to this big mansion that looks like a cathedral. And they would stay there and they would all come for dinner and they'd gather and then he'd make his entrance. This big man of 285 pounds, he'd make his entrance into the special dining room and they would all clap. All thought that it was wonderful to be there for dinner. And I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was just absolutely magnificent. But beneath it all, beneath it all, I said to the guide, was he religious? Did he have any God? And she was a school teacher, retired, taking this tour, very intelligent. Not a single evidence at this point that there was anything beyond what I see and what I see he can't see. And people have wealth and when they do, you envy it and you get jealous. Any good that you gather in life, if it's not admired by somebody else, what good is it? And all that he gathered, and all that he gloried in, he died like all people die. And this is not just a sermon on the finality of death. It's a message to explain that fulfillment only comes to the soul. It never comes to the flesh. And it only comes when you see the value of yourself in the person that you admire the most. So our Lord had nothing, but he had the Father. Our Lord's estimation of his self was based upon what the Father thought about him. And you and I as fathers are made frightfully insecure, running and stopping, going and coming, trying to find identity many places other than one as it relates to God, two as it relates to His Son, three as it relates to ultimate fulfillment, and last as it relates to what we are to others. This is where the Lord's work is identified. Here it is, and I'm through. This is God's work that you should believe on Him. Now stop there. Listen. This is God, the Father's work, that you should believe on the one that the Father has sent. What is the Father's primary responsibility? Now, may I speak personally? The Father's primary responsibility is to make sure that his children know the Heavenly Father and embrace Jesus Christ as Savior. I guarantee you I would want to resign the ministry if my sons and daughter were not saved. If I, as an earthly father, cannot manage and minister to my house, the Bible says I shouldn't even be an elder. That's what the Bible says. If a man does not manage his own household, he shall not manage the house of God. That's a Bible verse. If a man does not care for his own, Paul said, you consider him as an atheist, as an infidel. 
So the primary responsibility, fathers and men, is to make sure that your children grow up in the fear, reverence, and admonition, teaching of the Lord. The Bible says that women make the rules in the family and fathers bring the instruction. The rules in our family as a boy were set by my mother. My father used to say, what does your mother say? When my mother put the law down, that was it. But my father instructed, and he would say, I think what your mother has in mind is. You got it? What your mother and I think about this is that. And he would be the interpreter. He would be setting the atmosphere, giving the direction. He would say, have you ever seen your father or your mother do that? You're going to a certain place, son. Would you be comfortable if your mother or father were there? My mother used to say, don't do anything that embarrasses your father. My father was always advanced by my mother. And my mother was always respected by my father. The way you treat your parents is the way your parents are going to treat you. And the way you act, think, behave, decide, spend your money, where you go for entertainment, what you look at, what you read, what you say. The example is more important than your teaching. Society has the schools that they teach. Society has the church it preaches. But the basic fabric of society is the home. That's the example. And what is Jesus Christ? He is our example. And what is Jesus Christ as it relates to the Father? He's the replication, the example. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. One last thought. That's why Paul said, Timothy, you're my son. I'm your father. You follow and copy me, and you'll follow and copy God. Somebody says, do you want your children to be like you? If you're a godly father, you bet I do. For in the home, not in the church or in the theological education, not in the career or the vocation, not in outside directed influences or places of development and example, but in the home. If I'm one thing in this pulpit and another thing in the family room, I have no ministry as far as I'm concerned. I am a father, and only am I a father as I relate to the Father in heaven through Jesus Christ, become a believer and a follower of him, one who receives eternal life and begins to live forever the moment he believes and has a fulfillment and a maturity in life so that I can say, I hope it's true of me, as Jesus said in the 6th of John, Be you therefore perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And the word perfect, you know, doesn't mean perfection in flawlessness. It means fully developed and matured. We would say, he has it all together. My brother... I'm your servant in Jesus Christ. I'm a father. Are you believing on the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation? Do you have salvation so you don't even question it? Because if you have Christ, you will never be lost. And are you fulfilled 
Or are you finding your kicks and looking to fill in the cracks by things that only can be acquired by the flesh? And as a result of that, you're a father, but you're a carnal Christian. You're not hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Basically, you're here this morning and you're flat out empty. Then draw the resource and the strength for your soul from Him and give your life to Him. He owns your soul. Give your life to Him and be perfect. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, by Your grace and in Your Spirit, in Your house and through Your Word, with Your people and before Your eyes, we have come. And we pray that through the rhythm of the service, the elements that built worship for us, and the teaching of the scripture and the opening up your word, have prepared us for this moment of commitment and resolution. I pray for the invitation, the opportunity for open recognition of you, Holy Father, by men and women and boys and girls. Grant, O oh Lord, that we shall not be hearers only, but doers of the word, and that your Spirit will gather many or a few, as many as the Lord our God will determine. For this moment of holy consecration, we pray in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen.